By the 18th century, the Magna Carta values of religious and personal freedom shared by the colonists had gradually shaped the forms of representational government in the 13 colonies. As we've already seen, many immigrant families had suffered at the hands of oppressive church and state governments in Europe, and they were determined to ensure that America remained a land where people could live free from authoritarian control. There was no uniform type of civil government in the colonies, because each colony tended to follow the type of church government found in that colony. Typically, the four northern colonies had a democratic congregational model, where all church members had a say in how the church was run. The five middle colonies usually had a Presbyterian model, several elders governing a group of churches. However, the churches in the four southern colonies were generally Episcopalian. This means they were based on the Church of England's model, where each church was overseen by a single leader, a form of apostle. This gave rise to the acceptance, in turn, of a civil governor in each of the four colonies, or provinces as they were called, who represented the British monarch. The civic leaders would have been very familiar with the model of church government found in each of their respective colonies, because there was a strong Christian ethos in the colonial culture at that time. When in 1765, King George III and his Parliament passed the Stamp Act, imposing direct taxes on its faraway cousins, the colonists strongly objected to what they considered was taxation without their consent. They responded in various ways, including sending a petition to the King and Parliament in London. Benjamin Franklin, an inventor, printer, and the de facto American representative in England was summoned before the British Parliament in 1766 to justify the request for a repeal of the Stamp Act. He stated that Americans had freedoms based on their ancient rights as Englishmen, as declared by Magna Carta. Although Parliament relented and repealed the Stamp Act, they immediately passed the Declaratory Act, stating that Parliament had full power and authority to make laws and statutes of sufficient force and validity to bind the colonies and people of America in all cases whatsoever. This caused outrage in the colonies and the freedom battle lines between the people and their rulers started to form. Two Continental Congresses of the Colonies met in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania between September 1774 and July 1776 to find a way of resolving their grievances. They drew on Magna Carta to underpin their claims for freedom from what they considered to be oppressive rule by their King and the British Parliament. The trigger for the First Continental Congress was the harsh British response to the event known as the Boston Tea Party in 1773. The colonists objected to the imposition of a British tax on their imported tea. By way of boycott, many dressed as Native Americans dumped the tea in the harbour rather than accept it on land and incur import duties. The British Parliament, led by Prime Minister Lord North, retaliated by passing the Coercive Acts in order to punish the Massachusetts colony and cut off its commerce. This cartoon from the London magazine depicts the able doctor Lord North forcing a bitter draught down the throat of America, whose arms are restrained by Lord Chief Justice Mansfield. It was circulated widely in the colonies by Paul Revere, 
and gives an indication of the mood of many colonists at that time. The British actions served to unite many throughout the colonies. They gave practical and prayerful support to their fellow colonists suffering hardship in Massachusetts. Carpenter's Hall in Philadelphia was the venue for the first Continental Congress in the autumn of 1774. By this time, the colonists were calling the much-hated Coercive Acts the Intolerable Acts. Reverend Duchet, rector of Christ Church in Philadelphia, was asked to open the Congress in prayer. He acknowledged God's supreme power and control over kingdoms, empires and governments and asked God for mercy, protection, wisdom and direction in the councils of the assembled delegates. After much debate between the conservatives and radicals, a compromise was finally reached. All agreed to petition King George III for a remedy of their grievances and to boycott British goods being imported to the colonies. However, the king was unmoved. He ignored their petition and considered the rebels as traitors. The colonists' hopes for justice and a peaceful resolution of their grievances were now dashed. In April 1775, fighting broke out in Lexington and Concord as Britain began to use military might to enforce their will and rule upon the rebel colonists. So, a few months later, a Second Continental Congress was held in Philadelphia to manage what had now become a revolutionary war and also to agree a further coordinated response to the British Crown. Not everybody was in favour of revolution. Some English colonists remained loyal to the king and were strongly opposed to violence. This caused, in turn, a strong reaction from those patriots, as they were called, who are now risking their lives to obtain freedom from oppressive British rule. American blood has been spilled in Massachusetts Bay. And even now, General Washington is in Cambridge, where he leads a patriot army against hordes of British regulars, sent to our shores to ruin and enslave our countrymen. And yet, there are those who would ridicule the cause of America. There are those who would cast indignity upon the men who risk life and limb to defend our rights and liberties. The English political theorist and propagandist Thomas Paine gave vital support to the cause of the Patriots. He alluded to Magna Carta when he argued that the charter which secures this freedom in England was formed not in the Senate but in the field and insisted upon by the people, not granted by the Crown. In his earlier 1776 pamphlet, Common Sense, Paine directly attacked the tyranny of King George III and the corruption of his court. He used examples from the Hebrew scriptures in the Bible to support his case for the removal of the monarchy. Thomas Paine pointed out to his readers that God had created all of mankind equal, he reminded them that the ancient people of Israel had foolishly rejected God as their heavenly king and had asked for an earthly king like the pagan nations around them. They had persisted in this request, even though God had warned them through the prophet Samuel that this would lead to a form of tyranny and ultimately slavery. Pain was a deist. He accepted the belief in one creator God, but rejected the notion 
of subsequent divine intervention in human affairs. Consequently, he had no time for Christianity or other religions. Nevertheless, he knew that his kingly examples from the Old Testament would resonate with the biblically literate population at that time. It gave welcome religious and moral force to his case for the rejection of the British monarchy and the founding instead of an American Republic. The Age of Enlightenment in Europe, with its emphasis on reason rather than the Bible, as the main source of authority and legitimacy, was also a big influence. Paine skillfully used reason, hence the title of his pamphlet, to refute the claims of faith and authority by traditional religious and state institutions, and to encourage his readers to overturn conventional wisdom. He urged Americans to write their own Magna Carta and support the rights of mankind and the free and independent states of America. The Second Continental Congress met in Philadelphia in May 1776 and appointed a committee of five to draft a declaration for their consideration. This painting depicts three of the committee. Benjamin Franklin of Pennsylvania seated by the window with John Adams of Massachusetts. The Virginian delegate, Thomas Jefferson, stands alongside. Jefferson was asked to prepare the first draft of the Declaration. His main reference documents were his own draft of the Virginia State Constitution and the recently ratified Virginia Declaration of Rights, principally prepared by George Mason. Mason had, in turn, drawn on the English Bill of Rights of 1689, which had reflected the ideas of the influential English political thinker John Locke. Locke was a Christian who took a conservative view of the Bible, particularly with reference to God as creator of humankind in his image and likeness, with each and every individual having equal worth in his eyes. Locke saw the purpose of government to protect the life, liberty and property of its citizens. He viewed property as being not only external but also internal and intangible in nature. In other words, citizens should expect their government to protect their conscience, opinions, religious convictions and faculties, as well as their physical assets. The English Bill of Rights listed the ancient rights and liberties of the people of the realm, which had been violated by King James II of England. The bill was presented by Parliament to William and Mary of Holland when they were invited to become joint sovereigns of England in place of James II at the time of the bloodless, glorious revolution. On the 28th of June, 1776, the drafting committee presented their draft to the President of Congress, John Hancock of Massachusetts. After further debate and amendment, the momentous document, declaring the colonies to be free and independent states, was finally agreed and adopted by the Continental Congress on the 4th of July, 1776. The signatories to the declaration had one key foundational message to convey to London. Mankind's fundamental rights are God-given and not man-decreed. This was encapsulated in the now oft-quoted words, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, 
liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Curiously, Jefferson omitted the protection of the right to property, whether external or internal, and instead introduced the right to pursue a human state of being. Not surprisingly, historians have debated the reason for this substitution ever since. Interestingly, both property and happiness were mentioned in George Mason's Virginia Declaration of Rights. It seems that Jefferson's lifelong interest in the ancient Greek and Roman philosophers, especially Epicurus, may account for the inclusion of happiness. Followers of Epicurus were materialists who lived modestly and prudently. They sought freedom from fear and pain and believed that the pursuit of pleasure was the chief aim and virtue in a person's life and this would attain happiness in its highest form. This contrasts with the biblical worldview where the pursuit of holiness is held to be the primary aim in one's life that would lead, then, to happiness as a matter of course. As it turned out, King George III, rather than Parliament, was the target of Congress's fire. In a similar fashion to the English Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence lists the injustices inflicted by the king on the colonists. This echoed those similar grievances that the barons presented to King John at Runnymede in 1215. Having committed themselves to a course fraught with danger, the delegates conclude their declaration with an appeal to a higher power in the following words. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes and our sacred honour. Declaring independence was one thing. Shaking off the shackles of oppressive colonial rule and establishing a united nation-state was quite another. The third part of this American story will briefly explore the influence of Magna Carta in the drafting of the Republic's constitution and its implications for the state of the Union today. <laughs>